Good. Ready? Let's go. This intro is going to be electric, so just hold, hold on to your panties, all right? Hello, servus, grüß euch. Welcome. Grüß euch is hello for multiple people in dialect, Dylan. Okay. Hello, servus, grüß euch. Welcome to the podcast. He has a bird. I am your host, Sean Shelton. I am here with one of my closest friends, a teammate of mine from college, uh, Dylan Besser. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm excited. Good. Dylan is when I first started the podcast, I explained to people and people who know me personally know I take fantasy football very, very seriously. Um, the only person I know that takes it more seriously than I do <laughs> is Dylan Besser. So I wanted Dylan to come on to talk about, first of all, uh, fantasy football and kind of break down the draft since the draft is next week. And uh, I couldn't think of a better person. Uh, just, just as a quick story, I am in two dynasty leagues, dynasty fantasy football, which we'll get to later with Dylan. Dylan is the commissioner in one league. I'm the commissioner of the other league. Dylan, as a commissioner, constructed a 30 plus page. It's con- been expanding. I 30, think we're up to 40. 40 plus page constitution of league rules, bylaws, and overall process and function of the rules. Dylan is a lawyer by trade, so he's not uncommon or unfamiliar with long documents and reading etc so uh Seems it is, short to me it was absolutely absurd <laughs> i i tell people about it and they go what i showed uh another member of our league uh danny sour shout out danny he's the champion of the transatlantic football league that we're both in and he goes this is amazing and and terrifying at the same time so both <laughs> of right. us both of us love fantasy football uh don't can you explain to us a little bit why why you love it so much yeah, well, I was but, trying to uh, just think fantasy earlier. football in general. Yeah, uh, I think I first played fantasy football when I was 12 years old, and it was a four person league just with a few classmates in middle school. And now, 17 years later, uh, it's still my favorite hobby um, because one, we obviously love football, we mm-hmm. both played football. Um, and so, it's a easy way to pay attention to football more and have more investment in it. And uh, fantasy football has made NFL Sundays or Monday nights or whenever all the more exciting because even if it's a team that's not your favorite team, you have something to root for, something to root against. So it just made the entire Sunday for 10 hours um, extra entertaining throughout. But probably the biggest thing is Uh, you know, we live across an ocean and many countries apart and we still stay in touch more than a lot of other friends uh, that I have because it's fantasy football. There's always something to talk about with it. Exactly. Uh, And I just, there's always something new. It's all, it's always in fun, but the trash talk, it's always great. Mm -hmm. So. No, I, I think you're exactly right. I've become since really diving into fantasy football, I've become so much, more of a fan of the NFL and honestly a better fan because like you said, these Thursday night games against Jaguars, Titans, the, sh- the shitty games that they used to play or, or even preseason games because of dynasty, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, they, they actually are meaningful. You, you actually know the players. First of all, you know, almost every offensive player, if you're good at right. it and you have a rooting interest or a rooting against interest and probably a player every single game. Um, well, it makes, it makes every single transaction, even if it's an offensive lineman, it's like, man, how does that affect exactly. my team's running back? Exactly. I had Devontae Freeman last year. I still do in one of our leagues. And the Atlanta Falcons drafted two offensive linemen in the first round, and I was ecstatic. It's like, Paul, Devontae Freeman's about to rush for 2,000 yards. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> but, but no, it, it makes you so much more of a fan of the NFL. And I think it, you're exactly right is all of my closest friends from college were in a league together minus a couple, but a good section of them. And we talk year round because of fantasy football. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And the reason we can talk year round is because the leagues were in our dynasty leagues. And so a quick, a quick explanation of what a dynasty league is, is basically you keep your team every single year. So you have initial huge startup draft, you have expanded roster, so you're drafting anywhere from 20 to 30 to sometimes more guys. You keep them every single year. So the team that you draft, you have your entire year unless you cut or trade players. 
And basically on a year to year basis, you only draft rookies. So you have free agents and rookies, just like a normal NFL team to build your rosters. So because we're able, because that's the structure, there's always something relevant to fantasy football year round. And that's, I think that's the, that's the reason why I love it so much is because it's so much more engaging year round and uh, always has, gives you something to talk about. You know, why, why, do, why do you prefer <coughs> dynasty fantasy football? Why do you love it? That's okay. It doesn't matter. We're, we're, not, that prof- all excited. we're <laughs> not that professional of a setup. <laughs> all right. Judge, she's getting a little too excited. But, That's all right. Me too. Um, My nipples are hard. Let's go. <laughs> um, well, sorry for that. But, uh, That's all right. So, Dynasty, yeah, you, you said it exactly right. I mean, it's something we already love doing for four months out of the year. Why not do it for 12 months out of the year? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this past month we had a bunch of Dynasty stuff. Now we're getting ready for the NFL draft through a whole new lens. Um, and it'll just continue into the summer as now teams adjust their rosters with the draft. So I love dynasty. And it's like, you know, for people that played sports video games and stuff growing up, like when you do this, a dynasty in that, or you're crafting your whole team, it's kind of like this now more. It's not just, so oh, we have that one draft day in August and then we pay attention on Sunday. You're thinking about a full roster. And so I like that additional aspect of it. Yeah, no, I, I think you're exactly right. It's it's so much more entertaining. And even one league that we're in uh, even has contracts and you're 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 not only trying to build a roster, you're trying to evaluate uh, value of players, literally monetary value, just like a GM, which I think is so math. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and in doing so, you really have to pay attention to the NFL draft. The NFL draft is something I always enjoyed watching, no matter what. But now with this added layer to the, my fandom, um, I really – I've never done rookie. I found out who the rookies were, besides the obvious superstars in college, on draft day, right? And then I had Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay tell me about them. Now I know who they are prior, and I've done my research. And I want – now that we're – this will be aired the week, so next week, so uh, before the NFL draft, I'm curious – to, to hear who you have. We want to talk about the top rookies in every position and kind of see where, where each other has them ranked and then uh, kind of talk about some sleepers and some landing spots. So first and foremost, uh, I think quarterback is probably the easiest for a top five. That's right. Uh, Dylan, who do you have as your top five at quarterbacks going into the draft? Well, and I think it's because he's the obvious number one pick and he's the only one that's completely healthy uh, of the two that I'd consider. But Joe Burrow would be my number one mm-hmm. on that basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, he had probably the best college football season a quarterback maybe has ever had last mm-hmm. year. The only downside is he only had one year where he was that dominant. So. Right. And then uh, I kind of alluded to him, but Tua still is a, the only problem is his injuries. But, man – I think Tua was the better NFL draft prospect before that hip injury. So I think he's a pretty clear two still for me. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want me to go through all of my top Yeah, five? just go ahead. Just go ahead. All right. And then Herbert, even though I was never impressed with him, I guess I'm leaning on the people that do it as a profession are saying that he's polished. But Justin Herbert from Oregon. Um, Jordan Love, because I watched, I actually watched a little bit of his tape and – Obviously, he's nowhere near as good, but he kind of slings it around the field and, like, chucks it around a little bit like Mahomes did at Texas Tech. It's funny you say that. In my notes for Jordan Love, I have poor – in bold letters, very bold letters, poor man's Mahomes. Yeah. So, I think he has to go to the right team, but if he does, he's and he really has to, he has to he has to have a year like Mahomes did. Yeah. And right? then I have Jalen Hurts – uh, at five, which I think that they, I think at five there there could be depending on what the team wants a lot of different options. But Hertz is so dynamic. I think he should be the fifth quarterback. Okay, that's interesting. So I have I have my top five is exactly the same. Um, actually, top four is exactly the same. Excuse me. Number five, I think there's a there's obvious tiers, right? You have tier mm-hmm. one that you've indicated. Tier two is Herbert. Tier three is Love, and then you have a pretty significant tier three of guys that. Yeah. I don't even think will be relevant in the NFL. And, but I would probably, of that last year, I would probably put Eason fifth. Not that I love Eason, 
Uh, but I think he could have an adequate career as an NFL backup, lifetime backup. He, he played yeah. in a pro style system. Uh, he's an under center adjusted quarterback already. He's big as hell. He, he does have a relatively good arm because I like Jake Fromm too. Uh, but I don't think he has the skill set to be an NFL quarterback, especially particularly arm strength. And right. he was always surrounded with so much talent. I mean, his this thing about the three rece- or three running backs he's had for the last two years. I mean, so I would put Easton as number five, but I think it to do a top five, a quarterback doesn't really make sense. You're really looking at a top four and everybody underneath behind them probably are not going to be too impactful in the NFL. Yeah. I think, I think the top four are basically guaranteed at some point to get the starting job. They might all um, go in the first round, to be honest. Yeah. I, I think they will. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the other ones, it probably ends up 50-50 chance if they're ever really that relevant. Exactly. Um, but I, you, you named the other two that I had listed with Eason mm. and Fromm. Mm. So. The only thing about Hertz, uh, I think he is dynamic, but people like compare him to like Lamar Jackson. No. Because of, of athleticism and of uh, inaccuracy issues, right? But the reason why Lamar Jackson was so successful immediately is because the dude is an elite athlete. Like he's a 4 4 4 3 40 guy. He, uh, he was a Heisman winning quarterback because of his ability to stretch the field vertically, which he did have inaccurate. Ar- he w- did have inaccuracy, excuse me, but it, uh, arm strength was never an issue, right? And then he also had this elite athleticism. Hertz is a good athlete, but he ran a 4 6 at the 40, which I think really hurt him. And not only does he have inaccuracies, he also has arm strength issues. Uh, so, mm-hmm. which is. I think Hertz actually might be closer to like a Tim Tebow. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. I think yeah. that's exactly right. And he, he has Tim Tebow as qualities where people love him. He wins everywhere he goes. And, uh, and he's just strong as hell, right? He's this power lifter. He's just mm-hmm. power lifting guy. But, uh, but does his talent translate to the NFL? I don't know. Okay. Right. So moving on, moving on to running backs, who do you have as your top five running back prospects entering the draft? All right. So, um, and I, I really feel like the top three, I, I debated switching around, but I ended up with uh, DeAndre Swift from Georgia at one, mm-hmm. Jonathan Taylor from Wisconsin at two, and J.K. Dobbins from Ohio State at three. Okay, interesting. Uh, and then – Four, I got Cam Akers from Florida State. And then five, uh, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire from LSU. Okay. So I have, I, have, uh, I have the same five. And I think there's – you would probably say there's two tiers within that five, right? Yeah. There's the I top three and then the next two. So our, think, yeah. tier, our tiers are the same. But I would mix things around. We talked a little bit beforehand. And I think Jonathan Taylor needs a really – He's the best pure running back of the group, I think. But he, of between, from a fantasy football point of view, right? he is much more landing dependent than the other two. I think Swift's going to get his points and Dobbins are going to get his points because they're, right. they're dynamic and more creative than Jonathan Taylor. Uh, but Jonathan Taylor in the right system could be a 1,500-yard rusher consistently because of his – he ran a 4.3940. He has breakaway speed, which the other two don't really have. And he has great vision and patience, but he's not going to catch a ton of passes. And if, the, if nothing's blocked, he's not going to be able to be creative, in my opinion. I also uh, worry a little bit more with Jonathan Taylor that he's basically been a bell cow back in college for three years. Yeah. The, I, he's got I a was, ton of carries. I was wondering that too. And uh, they said there's no – analytical evidence that that's an issue but just from being a football player uh it makes a difference your yeah, body and running, feels different. running backs already have a short shelf life exactly i wouldn't want to take the chance if i don't have to exactly what, what what's going on with judge what's going on uh i opened the window because i thought maybe that would calm her down and i think that's made things worse oh uh-huh, okay for her, so uh, that's all right if, if we need to pause i can't it, no it's all good i i just i don't want her to be upset that's all and she's not she just wants to go play and this this will be all edited out of the podcast this portion okay Okay. but the video uh it's i don't want to spend time video editing it's much easier to audio edit and then so the 
the YouTube page is just unedited video. So okay, perfect. Well, that'll be more entertaining. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and then in regards to Kyd Edwards Alaire and Cam Akers, the thing, the the hiccup that I have with Kyd Edwards is I wonder if he was super productive because of the offense that he was on and just the talent that was surrounding him because Cam Akers was actually in the exact opposite scenario, right? That's so, true. So I don't know if Cam Akers is less talented or is not a better running back. It's just I would feel more comfortable because I've seen Kyd Edwards do it in the right scenarios. And I love the fact that he's just a compact power back. Uh, yeah. Cam Akers was just surrounded by nothing and trying to – be the offense basically unsuccessfully it seems like Mm -hmm. but on the flip side Clyde Edwards Hilaire had a lot more open space to operate with that's what I mean it just it because of the product of his environment gotcha gotcha yeah but I, I think both of those backs are explosive type guys and both of them have good pass game skills too. So like, I'm still very interested in both of them. Absolutely. Which both you could probably get in the fantasy, uh, in your fantasy rookie draft, you could probably get both of those guys towards the end of the first round, I hope which, so. which if, yeah, if you're, if you're a successful player and you have later first round picks, because just like the NFL draft, the teams with the lower rankings have earlier picks. So if you're a good team, and you already have a good roster, and you can get a Clyde edwards Lair or a Cam Akers to, Akers to fall for you, uh, that's huge because in normal uh, rookie drafts, because this rookie class is so strong at the skill pos- positions, well, that's all you draft is skill positions, but so deep at those positions, that maybe last year's draft, do you think a Clyde edwards Lair would have gone in front of a David Montgomery? I mean. Oh could have been There's right. So he, many running backs. Last year he could have been a top five pick. Where this year he's yeah. probably going to go ten to fourteen or something, depending on landing spot, which we'll talk right. about later. Right. So res- receivers, Dylan, what do you think about for a top five receiver? I think there is so many good receivers Ooh. that it's hard to limit it to five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's hard to limit it. To five. All right, I got to do something with her. Okay, so no problem. We got to pause for two minutes. Sounds good. All right. All right, let's do this. Okay, good. Not a problem, my man. Um, so receivers, Dylan, what, what are you thinking about your top five receivers? So there, as I was saying, there's so many good receivers this year. It's, it's hard to limit it to five. Um, and a lot of like the second group we can talk about more later because there's so many. But there's a clear top three to me that are mm-hmm. all going to go probably in the first half of the first round. Um, or at least in the in the teams, I think. Mm-hmm. That's Jerry Judy from Alabama, C.D. Lamb from Oklahoma, and Henry Ruggs from Alabama. All three studs. And then the next group, I think Justin Jefferson from LSU is probably the fourth. Mm-hmm. And then I had a lot of debate back and forth about who I was going to put at five. Um, I think – because he's getting a lot of – I think he's the most raw, but long-term he might be one of the best, Denzel Mims from Baylor. Okay. So I'm going to put him at five. But then I've got – I still want to rattle off some more. So Go these ahead. are some of Go your ahead. sleepers. Go T. Ahead. Higgins from Clemson, he could be a first-rounder. Yep. Brandon Ayok from Arizona State could be a first-rounder. And LaVishka Chenault from Colorado, yep. he yep. could be a first-rounder. Yeah, no, that I think you the the next guy you probably would have named is going to be my sleeper to talk about. So I'm glad you didn't name him. Okay. Uh, and I I completely agree with you. I think I think I would probably put T Higgins number five, but I think I think they're so close in talent and ability that after the draft, the four that you just named might be in a different order. Yeah. Yeah. Just based on scenario, so. Uh, I'm not going to split hairs. I think the top three receivers will be very interesting to go to mm-hmm. um, uh, where they go. And it'll be very interesting. CeeDee Lamb, I think is, I enjoy watching that guy play football. He's a really, really good football player. Mm-hmm. So excited to see where that, I think the first round, the first round Thursday night, the first round of the draft for us Friday morning uh, will be super interesting where these guys go. Cause there could go there. I think three for sure, like you said, in the teens, but there could be five or six receivers drafted in the first round this year. Yeah. Alternatively, a lot of teams may think that they can just wait because there's so many good ones. 
So it'll be could. interesting to see how it goes. But you know, you know, the Raiders are going to draft rugs. Oh, That's, for sure. For sure. Like they oh, can't. Oh, for sure. If, 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 uh, the Raiders are the only for sure picking a wide receiver. <laughs> and, the, and the for sure picking rugs, because if we know the Raiders, <laughs> even though Al, late Al that Davis will be in the room and go, hey, that dude is fast. We need to draft <laughs> his right. ass. Right. Did you see his 40? So uh, top five of tight ends might be redundant. The tight end class this, this year is pretty weak. Uh, I'll, I'll just name a couple. Uh, Cole Komet is seems to be the hands-down top tight end, mm-hmm. but – I think he'll be a better NFL tight end than he will be a fantasy football tight end. And then you have guys like Adam Trotman who played FCS football. You have Hunter Bryant, who's more of a receiver than he is a tight end. Bryce Hopkins is interesting out of Purdue. Uh, Harrison Bryant actually won the best tight end award. I forget what the name of the award is for college. Uh, One of the name awards, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, whatever. Uh, but he was FAU and he's undersized. So I don't want to get too much into the uh, weeds about the tight ends. Uh, but do you, do you agree that Cole Komet is probably the best tight end prospect in the draft? That's what, you know, that's what they're saying. Uh, yeah. I don't think there was any, there's no tight end in like college football. And I, I watch less college than I watch in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like there's some years going into the draft where it's like, man, you know, I think even last year. Last like year was a perfect Hawkinson, example. no Noah fan. Like there was, there was tight ends before the draft that we knew, like, I want to get my hands on them. Mm-hmm. All of these, it's, it's kind of like, eh, you know, if they end up on a team that doesn't really have a pass catching tight end, that makes it more interesting. But otherwise it's, uh, who knows? Yeah. And, and tight ends are some of the, in doing the rookie for uh, the rookie dress for a couple of years. Now tight ends are one of the positions I, I enjoy watching the most. Like I really enjoyed watching the, the Hawkinson and Fant film the other, the other year. And, the, actually, my favorite prospect that I got my hands on super late, it wasn't in the rookie draft. It was actually in our startup draft, uh, was Jake Butt uh, from Michigan. And watching mm-hmm. his, I mean, super impressive that people that large can move that well and block. But this year, it's a kind of underwhelming class. Mm-hmm. Um, so that leads us to, that's a top five. But what, what, what guy in every position that isn't in that top five or might not be a name that you think like, Hey, people should keep their eye on because with the light, the right spot, even if they are a fourth, fifth round pick, uh, they could, they could do something not only in the NFL, but fantasy and fantasy. Well, I'm going to skip over quarterback. I didn't have any, did you have a sleeper down for quarterback? The only one I thought was interesting was, uh, Anthony Gordon. Okay. You know, he has a, he has a Minshew comp. They played at the same, yeah. A lot of passing. Same college. Yeah. They obviously a skilled passer, a very accurate passer. Um, and like Minshew, you know, if they're put in, they're so they know how to sling the football. Uh, will make mistakes. Just like Minshew, I don't think they'll be all pro quarterbacks. But you know, for for a team that needs a backup or is uncertain with their starting quarterback, and they grab them late in the draft, um, somebody to keep your eye on if you do play dynasty fantasy football yeah and i think a lot of a lot of the the other quarterbacks are going to be backups for a while Mm -hmm. you know so but he actually he actually has the talent like like i said with eason where i could see eason being a backup but i don't know if he could ever be like a uh a spark in a pan like minshew has been for the jaguars like it's just crazy enough that gordon has the skill set where if he did get a crazy opportunity like Minshew did he might be productive and earn himself a starting job or I don't see that for the rest of them. Mm-hmm. It's like, Hey, thanks for coming in and playing backup. Oh, okay. Our starters back. I don't right. see them ever earning a job. Right. Um, all right. So at running back, I have two guys. Well, one guy that's definitely running back Zach Moss from Utah who put up some of the best stats, but then he did not test very well at the combine. So I think he's going to fall, but I think that means he's going to end up, on a really good team. That's like a, as that's a Chiefs fan, I would I would love the Chiefs to take Zach Moss like in the fourth round. Yeah. But um so I think he's and he's by the way, if the Chiefs took him spot. in the fourth round, he would climb fantasy oh, yeah. boards. Yeah. You know, anybody yeah. who drafts the Chiefs was or the Chiefs draft, which we'll talk about later. Right. Uh, 
And then I don't know if he's going to play running back or wide receiver. He was mostly a wide receiver in college, but Antonio Damn Gibson it. at Memphis. Yeah, that's See, my guy. We should have talked about it before. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, Antonio Gibson, he had 33 carries last year at running back, but averaged like eight yards a carry. I forget what the mm-hmm. number was, but um, he ran a 4 3 9 40, which would have been tied with um, Jonathan Taylor. Uh, did mainly play receiver, but dude's dude super impressive. It was so yeah. much fun to watch his film. So he's going to be like an offensive weapon. Um, and and side note from a dynasty or from a fantasy football, if even if he is like a Tariq Cohen type of back, but also he's large, he's two hundred thirty pounds. Uh, but if he even if he lines up in the slot, if they have him listed as a running back, that's hugely valuable for you because running backs are so hard to come by. Valuable ones yep. are, are producing one that I, I'm interested to see what even position they announce, announce him as when he does get drafted. Mm-hmm. It's running back or receiver. Because he was at the combine as a receiver. Yeah, I'm going to jump down since we're talking about who knows what position they're going to play. So I have read that Chase, Chase Claypool, he was a wide receiver at Notre Dame, mm-hmm. but he's 230 pounds. I think he could eventually be a tight end. I don't think he'll be a great wide receiver, but if he becomes like a pass catching tight end, he's probably mm-hmm. going to be one of the best tight like, ends in the draft class. Like the like an H back move move well, type like of tight end. Yeah, yeah. Darren Waller was a wide receiver. And now yeah, yeah. He's, now he's tight end. But, or even guys like Irv Smith Jr., who there is a tight end, and he's right. just he's that twelve personnel, twenty personnel guy that comes in and might catch six, seven balls a game. Right. But actual wide receivers that I like, and they're two very different types of players. Um, Antonio Gandy Golden from Liberty is a okay. huge dude. Um, and he went up against poor competition, so it's tough to tell, but he's just a massive wide receiver and put up crazy numbers. So I think he could, I mean, I think he, if he finds a role on a team, he's going to be good for, uh, qu- I think he's going to be a touchdown guy down the road. Okay. And then, and then KJ Hamler from uh, Penn State is a small guy, but a massive weapon for them. So I think KJ Hamler. Uh, would be an exciting player and he's also a sleeper good to know I think receiver is the one position that I haven't studied the most and so this I don't know if he would even be considered a sleeper he's the guy that you hadn't mentioned but I think he's next on everybody's ranking would be Michael Pittman Jr. out of USC I have Uh, him down as well yeah so he's not I wouldn't know if he's necessarily a sleeper or not but uh He's I don't also, think he's going in the first round. I don't think there's no. any chance. So. But talent-wise, I think he's right comparable with that tier, if mm-hmm. not like a sub-tier of that tier. So uh, not this flashy draft pick, but the dude is is an impressive football player. He's, a, he's 6'4", so he's a bigger body receiver. He's like that prototypical guy, um, those tight – the receiver ones, like your stereotypical – Right. split out receivers and i think he could f- fulfill that role for some teams that uh don't have one like um like if he went to uh philadelphia that would be interesting and and you know they don't have to rely on alshon and he was that alshon replacement or um uh i should have thought of this beforehand the jets the jets would be a good one now that the they jets, lost that the they jets lost. are relying on jameson Robbie crowder and, and- Brashard Perryman. I think they need an actual one receiver. That's a that's a really good a really good uh, place. So so if he fell into a scenario like that, um, he could be very very productive. But maybe not that post draft. Like oh man, they got right. him. But right. I could see him being very productive. Well, and that's that's the thing with a lot of the wide receivers is typically running backs make an impact more quickly than sometimes mm-hmm. rookie wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Um, and also for dynasty league, a little pointer wide receivers are more valuable long-term because running backs lives are shorter in the NFL, but that also means you want their careers sure. are shorter and maybe their they're, lives afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're NFL lives. Yeah. Um, but, but that also means that like identifying the, the young running backs and getting them because running back cycle through and then if you can find a couple of wide receivers that you get early and then you've got them for 10 years because that doesn't happen with a running back exactly no. exactly and you you had mentioned your tight end already uh my tight end was um colby parkinson 
from from Stanford. You know, you talked about da- Darren Waller, and I think he could be because he's not really a tight end, which is kind of what you're looking for at tight end, right? Like, right. Like you don't want the guy who's super good at blocking catches two touchdowns a game or two uh, touchdowns a season or two balls a game or whatever. And he's a very good NFL player, Kyle Rudolph, for example, right? right? Like he used to be productive. Now he's more of a blocking role. Very good tight end, not the guy you want. Darren Waller, not a good tight end, great receiver, but he's listed as a tight end. So uh, exactly. he could be that. He's not as fast, I don't think. He ran a four seven seven, but the dude is six seven, and it, and moves like a receiver. You know, like he his three cone was really good. He speed cuts really well. He looks like a giant size receiver. So if he got into an offense, like um, like like they use Ertz in Philly, Ertz is a better inline tight end, can put his hand in the dirt. But like when Goddard is in the game, Goddard is more of your traditional tight end and they use your Ert as like a flex tight end. If he got into an offense that used him like that, even though he might get drafted or maybe even undrafted, uh, he could be productive in that role. But that's a yeah. reach because even like the real sleeper would have been um, Adam Troutman because he played at Dayton and – you know, dominated at Dayton. So he could be a sleeper, but he's also probably the second best tight end in the class from a dynasty standpoint or a fantasy right. standpoint. So it's not a very good tight end class. So we have, we alluded to some spots earlier, but now what, what I think, I think the quarterbacks, we don't have to talk about quarterback. I've talked about it prior on this, like the quarterback spots are, are obvious, right? You have new England, uh, now, which if a late Jordan Love maybe would be interested, but there's only a handful of teams that actually need quarterbacks now. So you have Cincy, Chargers, Miami as like your top three, and that's where they think those top three quarterbacks will go. And then maybe a later pick would be, you know, maybe now Jacksonville because they got rid of Foles or New England because Tom Brady, et cetera, et cetera. But those spots are kind of obvious of – who would be productive in those scenarios? It's basically whoever needs a quarterback. Right. Uh, so from a running back standpoint, what are the, Oh, I have the... some, I have some quarterback spots that I think okay. you should pay attention please. to please. because the perfect example is teams that are playing one year in advance. Uh, the chiefs with Mahomes. Now he was obvious. They traded up. He's the 10th overall pick, mm-hmm. but look for teams that have an established quarterback that still trade up to get a quarterback. Sure. And, and that the would team be that a draft I, tidbit. Yeah, the team that I am most interested in the quarterback because I think they're going to draft a quarterback uh, is the Saints because I don't think Taysom Hill's the answer. No, that's so, interesting. That's a good. So point. I want to see who the Saints take. Yep, that's um, a good because I, I think they're going to spend a draft pick in the first couple rounds. But it was so weird. Sean Payton already said that he thinks Taysom Hill is a franchise quarterback, which I can't nah, believe. Nah, I can't believe, nah. and I, I I'm very surprised that it. that Teddy walk. Yeah. Uh, because I would have done the opposite. I would have let Taysom walk and kept Teddy if Teddy wanted to stay. But, no, that's Great. a good point. That's a good point. Almost a little bit like um, not quite because I don't want to compare the two quarterbacks, but like last year, New York Giants, right? You have an established veteran, obviously towards the end of his career. I don't think Drew Brees is going to get benched by any way, shape, or form. Um but a scenario like that where it's a great spot, landing spot, you just have to wait a year. And I think that's yeah. a good point. That's a good All point. All right, but running backs, um, running backs, it's it's a lot more tricky because every team probably ha- has a running back mm-hmm. that is going to get carries. Um, and so really you're looking at – you're looking for good offenses um, for landing spots and ones that don't have a bell cow back. Like, I mean – going to the Cowboys doesn't really help you that much because Zeke is going to get 20 carries. But um, I think the two most, two most obvious teams that I think, I think the Bucks and the Dolphins, um, the Bucks, mm-hmm. I know they got Ronald Jones, but I don't think nah. he's the answer. Nah. Um, and then the Dolphins, they signed Jordan Howard, but Jordan Howard nah. is just, he's a replaceable back. So I think both of those places getting running back. Um, and then I have a long list of other ones, but, do you have some other teams off the top of your head? No, I think I think I think Tampa Bay and uh, Miami are the obvious were like guys can come in and be workhorses uh, yeah. because they did the Bucks didn't draft did invest high draft capital on Ronald Jones, but he's just he's not a fit that was pre Arians, 
right? Mm -hmm. And he's just not a yeah. fit for what Arians does. And, and right. he's not even a good pass blocker. So he, he, that's why Peyton Barber played so much, you know? And Miami is, there's nobody, you know, I, I can't even, I don't even know the guy who finished the season. Patrick Laird, Laird. come Laird. on. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know of him. So so I think those are two great spots. And then the 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 next spots that you'll name, you, you're also looking for good offenses, but you, it's a similar, I think it's even a similar approach to what you said in quarterback where you have to be a little bit creative. But I'm curious to what 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 your next grouping of of spots are. So the next grouping are kind of running back by committee teams, but mm. teams that are getting them in there. I know that they're still going to get carries or going to get production, or I assume that they are if they use a higher round draft pick on this running back. If they take one of the guys we talked about earlier. Um, the homer one is the Chiefs. If the Chiefs take one of those top guys. But that's unanimous. And anytime right. you listen to anybody. But but um one of the places, and I like Devin Singletary, but I think the Bills are gonna take uh a running back early. Um and I think that I think Singletary will still be valuable. And if the Bills take one of those guys, um, because they want to run the football. Mm -hmm. Um and the Seahawks, I know that they have Chris Carson, but he gets hurt every year. Mm -hmm. So I think they'd be happy to add somebody. Um and then I think the Falcons, because I think Gurley is a one-year player for them, mm -hmm. and none of those other guys on their roster are any good. No, so I would I, love to see the Falcons take a, a running back in the first few rounds. Yep. No, I you took the Falcons is going to be a good one. It's almost it's almost similar to the notion that you said about um, quarterbacks in regards to look for the aging veteran, right? Yeah. On a short term, at the end of his contract, or on a one-year contract. So. I would be really interested to see who goes to Atlanta and if there is like a, like one of these all around good running backs, like a, like you mentioned Zach Moss or like a Keyshawn Vaughn or, or a guy um, that that's interesting to me, like from Dallas, like a DJ Dallas or from Miami, DJ Dallas, yeah. somebody like that who I think is talented and just might have to wait a little bit. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, and then I, I look for, for, I'll be interested to see, what these teams with franchise running backs are doing franchise tag running backs. What, what is Tennessee going to do in the draft to address running back right. issue? Like, do you have to wait a year and then get the successor to Derrick Henry? That's not bad. Like if they draft, like, uh, uh, I, I don't like AJ Dillon, but they compare him. I think he's bad. He's but, just a worse version. Yeah. He's just, a, he's a Derrick much Henry. worse. Yeah, exactly. But if they got like a Michael Warren from Cincy, who's also a talented and he was compared to Jordan Howard. And he's also a talented between the tackles runner. And if he could get the opportunity that other backs don't get, then that would be interesting. Uh, or I, I'm very curious to what Arizona does in the draft. Mm -hmm. At running back, they've already mentioned about adding a third between uh, Drake, who's on a franchise tag, who I don't think they'll extend. Uh, Edmonds is still a cheap back, so there's no reason to get rid of him. But they proved, they have proven that that position is super productive and multiple people can produce in that running back spot because yeah. Edmonds was a beast before he got hurt, which then Drake stepped in. So positions like that, because like you said, there's not that many obvious spots because so many people are running back by committee now that mm -hmm. scenarios like that where, okay, who, what does Arizona and Tennessee and Atlanta do who need a running back potentially next year? And then you have, and then you have like a slew of teams like the Colts would be interesting because they're a line, and Marlon Max always hurt, and they don't really have anybody behind him. Um, you know, people talk about the Jets, but I want to stay away from Gaze as much as possible. You yeah. know, I think Redskins could use a running back. Their leading rusher last year was Adrian Peterson, obviously not who he used to be. So uh, there are some interesting spots, but I think you you and I hit the main ones, especially you in regards to the chiefs. You want, you want Andy Reid running backs, no matter what in the same token, you want San Francisco running backs, which is a crowded backfield right now, but maybe they get rid of Tevin Coleman or maybe they cut McKinnon. Most of it's not young either as Coleman. Uh, so you just got to kind of be creative and look for which offenses running backs are producing, no matter what the running back is. And just honestly, opportunity. Right. Opportunity is much more important for running backs than any of these other positions. We're looking exactly. At. Exactly. And what, are, what is, what is the spot of two for, for a receiver that you're looking at? So 
and kind of with that, like almost every team, like should probably look to add a receiver at some mm-hmm. point. So for like the immediate impact, uh, I looked at teams that who could be a rookie wide receiver that could immediately have a chance of being their number one. And I think that the three teams that have a, there's three teams that I think have a chance at them being a number one, but then there's some other teams that they'd be the number two wide receiver for them, but still very valuable. The three number ones are the Jets, Raiders. I'm kind of tossing the Eagles in because I think yeah. Alshon Jeffrey. Um, but I think Jets, Raiders, and Eagles, they could step in and almost immediately be the top receiver for them. Mm-hmm. And then I have I have three uh, – or I have four uh, other teams that I would love a good wide receiver to head their way. Um, the Colts, Vikings, 49ers, and Packers. But I think just – those teams, they, they, they're the Colts, like, yeah, they got T.Y. held and they don't really have much established behind him. Mm. Um, the Vikings, I mean, Kirk Cousins, it, he is efficient and they just trade away stuff on digs. And then 49ers and Packers, um, well, Packers, they don't have anybody behind Devontae Adams. And then the 49ers, I mean, that offense just hums most of the time. So, adding a piece to them, I think, would be great. No, I, I think, I think those are all really, really, really good examples and i was going to say as well the vikings i'm really interested to see because they've obviously shown that they could maintain two very very productive receivers mm-hmm. and exactly. i think the only thing the only thing on the list your list that i would be interested i want to know how the rams fill uh cooks void you know they talk about they talk about reynolds a lot but he's had opportunity to play because cooks had multiple concussions last year right. and it never what it almost like the third guy that stepped in was uh, the tight end. Um, Higby and Everett. Higby. <clears throat> Higby was super productive at the end of the season. It wasn't really Reynolds. So I don't know if they're sold on Reynolds. So if they if they spent, and with Woods getting older, if they spent a second round or a third round draft pick on a receiver, I think that would be interesting as well. Yeah. And then tight end is just, it is what it is. And you're from a, dyna- from a fantasy football's perspective, you, you're better off getting a prospect that's been in the league for a year or two than actually drafting a tight end because it, it takes really long for tight ends to develop stereotypically. And, uh, and this year is just a weak class. So go out and grab an Ian Thomas for the Panthers. That was Greg Olson's backup. Go out and grab uh, Noss and docs from the bills. Go out and grab um, some of these guys that you've never heard of yet. Did you say Uh, Noss and docs? What is it's Dawson Knox, isn't it? Oh shit. <laughs> uh, oh. But yeah, no, I agree. I mean, unless unless some team surprises next week and drafts a tight end in the first couple rounds, I don't know if but you even, have much faith in that. But even then, like last year, uh like the Drew Simple or Stimple or whatever. You know, like he, he might be a good football player and apparently he's a good blocker and they wanted that and they invested second round draft capital on it, I think. Yeah. But he's not going to be a fantasy football player. And I think Cole Komet will be the same. He might go pretty high because he's a good football player. But I don't know if he's going to be producing anywhere near for you to even consider putting him in your lineup. Right. So yeah, That's fair. No. Dylan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, please, if you, are, if you are listening to this and you're interested in fantasy football, just start. Just start. Yeah. And uh, There's so many – resources out on the internet yeah. now it's a whole new industry i mean it's not even new anymore but it's a right. whole industry there's plenty of stuff out there to read up on exactly uh, and um i hope we gave you a couple of things to look at and some names while you're watching the nfl draft to to consider uh also i'm doing i haven't told dylan about this but i'm doing the espn draft challenge i've already created a group and i think it's a series of like projections of where you think people get drafted uh, I'm going to send that out with this, with this podcast or maybe even a bit before. So if you guys want to join that and do that with me and compete with me in that regard and see if I actually know what I'm talking about uh, <laughs> or if I'm like Mel Kuyper, Tom Mache, where I get paid to hypothesize, um, do that if you want to. And uh, maybe, maybe if some really interesting things happen, uh, maybe we can get back together and do it again in a few weeks and kind of reanalyze the draft. But uh it's really like this whole podcast. Um, it's being pushed on what you guys want and the content is what you guys want. So let me know what you think about this podcast. Let me know if it was interesting or not, what we, what you like us to continue to talk about, what we, you wish there was more of. 
and then we can continue adjusting and make it a podcast worth listening to during this shitty time. It sounds good. The draft's yeah. always exciting, and then we have plenty to talk about for fantasy once the draft's over. So. Always, always. We have a Dylan and I will have two drafts coming up. That's and right. so this was what you guys didn't realize is this was a game of poker a little bit where we're trying to we're trying to give our cards because we want you guys to have good content, but we're also like, yeah, I'm drafting. And one draft, I'm the draft I'm the pick ahead of him in the first and the second round, I believe. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, Dill, now I know. So you that's know right, I know right. this guy. So I actually don't like any of these players at all. So good, you can good. pass on them and I won't pick them either. So. Good. Good. Good to know. Dill, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Sean. Bye.